Hello, I would like to welcome everyone to Webinar Wednesday. This week's presentation is entitled, Well Woman, Have You Had Your Exam? presented by Matthew Isom. A little bit about today's presenter. Matthew is certified by the American Board of Obstetrics and Gynecology. He earned his residency at San Antonio Services Health Education in 2003. He cares for patients at the Cinco Ranch location, and he has been with us since 2012. I'm going to turn it over to Matthew now. Good morning, everybody. Uh, as Elliot said, I'm Dr. Isom. I uh, am a board-certified obstetrician gynecologist at the Cinco Ranch Clinic. I joined uh, Kelsey in August of 2000. Uh, 12. Prior to that, I was in private practice. Uh, today, uh, we're going to quickly go over uh, some of the components of the Well Woman visit, and we'll get everyone up to speed on the current screening guidelines and talk about when it's appropriate to perform additional evaluations and immunizations and such. And if you have any questions that pop up, we'll have some time at the end uh, for question and answer. It is important to begin the visit with some background information and not just jump straight into the exam. You can literally uh, do the examination portion of the well woman visit in just a few minutes, but it is the documentation of health habits, history, counseling, and education that are the meat of the appointment and the cornerstone of a comprehensive well woman exam, or well woman visit rather. Uh, I always make it a point to go into the room and spend a few minutes uh, talking with the patient before they have been dressed for the exam. Uh, this gives me an opportunity to start to develop a rapport with the patient and allow them to feel a little more comfortable. And this is why the visit really should be called the well woman visit and not the well woman exam because it truly is much more than just an exam. It is important to quickly ask about any medical problems or issues that the patient is having, including medications that they're on and any allergies that they may have. Uh, you should ask the patient if they're sexually active, what they're using, if anything, for contraception, and touch on safe sex practices. This is also a point where you can address any fertility issues they may have. Um, ask the patient if they exercise regularly and try to get a feel for how important exercise and eating healthy are to them. Um, I'm certainly not the tobacco police, but patients need to know that lung cancer is still one of the leading causes of cancer death in the United States and that there are many reputable smoking cessation programs that are available. Uh, with regard to mental health, uh, most patients ju won't just come out and tell you that they're depressed. So after we've spent a few minutes uh, talking and I feel that they're more comfortable, I will certainly ask them about it if I feel it's necessary. Obesity is a huge problem in the United States, uh, so a calculation of a patient's body mass index is important. I routinely ask if a patient would be interested in nutrition or dietary counseling, and you would be surprised at how many say they would be. Uh, vital signs are certainly important, specifically blood pressure. Uh, there have been several occasions when someone has come in for a well woman visit and has had extremely elevated blood pressures uh, to the point where we've had to give them medication to bring it down and then get them quickly referred to primary care for undiagnosed hypertension. Uh, this is one of the beauties of working in the Kelsey system because in many of the clinics uh, you can get them set up for a primary care appointment uh, almost immediately so that they don't even have to leave the building. Um, a cursory skin exam may reveal any unusual moles or skin lesions or you can ask the patient if they have any unusual skin lesions that are of concern to them I usually will quickly palpate the thyroid, listen to the heart and lungs, and palpate the abdomen. And we'll go into a little bit more detail about the pelvic exam and breast exams in the following slides. The 
The first portion of the pelvic exam is quickly to inspect the vulva and perineum, uh, which is the external genitalia for any abnormalities. Uh, once the speculum is placed, it's important not only to look at the cervix, but the entire vagina for any unusual lesions or abnormalities and to assess for any pelvic support issues such as bladder prolapse or uh, rectum, rectal prolapse. Uh, a pap smear or other test may then be done if appropriate, and we'll talk a little bit more about this in a little bit. A bimanual exam is important to make sure that there are not any abnormal masses or tenderness in the midline or ovarian regions. Uh, inspection of the anus and rectal exams may be warranted in some cases. It is important to quickly inspect the breasts for any abnormal lesions or areas of dimpling. I tend to then have the patient uh, lay on their back and I usually start with the left breast. I begin by palpating the underarm area for any enlarged lymph nodes. Uh, I then palpate the chest wall above the breast and check to check for any masses or uh, enlarged lymph nodes. I then examine the breasts from the outside and toward the nipple area for any masses or areas of tenderness. I then repeat this on the patient's right side. And while I'm performing the exam, I'm usually talking to them about self-breast exams and how they need to perform them, as well as when they should be performed and areas that they need to concentrate on. And uh, we'll touch uh, on breast cancer screening guidelines here shortly. In the following slides, we will go over the most recent screening guidelines for cervical cancer, breast cancer, and other screening guidelines. I feel that we're very fortunate in our specialty to have screening tests for a couple of the cancers that can affect women because there are certainly uh, many cancers that do not have screening tests. Obviously, for most of us that have been in practice for a while, uh, the new cervical cancer screening guidelines are, have have some major changes. Um, I personally uh, tell my patients that no pap smear is needed prior to the age of 21, regardless of sexual activity, and that if they have a normal pap smear, that it does not need to be done again for three years. After looking at all of the research and data that was used to come to this decision, the bottom line is that the chances of uh, someone going from normal to full-blown cervical cancer in three years is like 0. .000 something percent. It's almost unheard of. Cervical cancer is a very indolent disease and it takes many, many years to progress from normal to full-blown cervical cancer. It's certainly not something that happens overnight and evidently not in three years either. Uh, with regard to ages 30 and above, I must confess that I personally have not adopted the five-year interval as of yet, and I'm still using the three-year interval for patients over 30. I uh, also tell them in, that in all of my years of practice, the cervical cancers that I have diagnosed, which is usually about five or six a year, it seems to be the same exact story every single time. It's usually a woman who comes in in their 40s, 50s, or 60s who's been having abnormal bleeding and spotting all over the place and by the way I haven't seen one of you guys in about 18 years. Uh, these are the women that are usually diagnosed with cervical cancer. Studies have shown that women that are seen and examined frequently will uh, rarely if ever be diagnosed with cervical cancer and if something is ever picked up it will be very early miles away from cancer and easily taken care of. Obviously, uh, at some point in a woman's life, there is no longer any need to do pap smears, and the American College of ob has uh, chosen 65 as that age. So if you have a history of normal pap smears and you hit 65, then pap smear screening can be discontinued in this population. Uh, the reasoning behind this is that if your pap smear is normal at 65, then something else is likely to happen before you develop cervical cancer. Just a quick note on uh, HPV or human papillomavirus. This is a virus that is transmitted sexually. Upwards of 80 percent of the sexually active population in the United States harbors this virus. What does it mean? 
if you are HPV positive, uh, specifically if you have one of the high risk subtypes, it can increase your risk of having an abnormal pap smear. Just because you have a high risk HPV subtype doesn't mean your pap smear will be abnormal, only that you should be seen at routine intervals and not uh, disappear off the grid for you know long stretches of time. There is currently a vaccine that's available that can protect someone from getting the most common of the high-risk subtypes, and it is currently indicated for girls and boys aged 9 to 26, but they are working on expanding this to other age groups as well. Uh, during a pap smear, if you are 30 years of age or greater, uh, along with the pap smear, we automatically check for high-risk HPV. From 21 to 29, it is only checked if there's an abnormality on the pap smear. Another common question we get is, you know, if I've had a hysterectomy, do I still need a pap smear? And the short answer to that is no. If you've had a hysterectomy for benign reasons, uh, meaning that it was not done for any type of cancer, then a pap smear does not need to be done again. Uh, the woman should still, however, have her annual well woman exams or visits where pelvic and breast exams are performed. I, uh, with regard to breast cancer screening, I usually have women start getting their well woman visits at age 21. I, a lot of patients ask when their daughter should come in to see the gynecologist for the first time if they're having no problems. The American College of ob recommends ages 13 to 15. I usually tell them to come in when they get into high school. Uh, this office visit is usually educational only with no exam performed. And we talk about contraception, STDs, safe sex practices, menstrual cycle 101, well woman visits, self breast exams, etc. Obviously a pelvic exam needs to be performed prior to the age of 21 if it is clinically indicated but I really try to avoid this if possible. self press exams should be performed monthly. The optimal time to perform them is right after the period is finished. The time to avoid doing them is just prior to periods when hormones are swirling and you get the lumpy, bumpy, tender stuff going on. I tell them that it's all about familiarity. Uh, you know your breasts better than anyone, so if you know what they feel like month after month after month after month, if something were to pop up, knowing what they normally feel like, bingo. That's the whole big thing behind it. It's, it's not a formal thing. You don't have to block off an afternoon to do your breast exam. It's something you can do uh, very quickly in the shower or while you're laying in bed. And if you have no primary relative, which is a mother or a sister, with a history of breast cancer, then we usually begin uh, annual screening mammograms at age 40. These are the uh, colorectal cancer screening guidelines. Uh, currently, colon cancer is the third leading cause of cancer in the United States. Uh, if you have no family history of colon cancer, then it is recommended that you have a screening colonoscopy at age 50. For African Americans, they recommend age 45 because there's a higher prevalence in this population. There are some alternative tests uh, to a colonoscopy. Uh, such as a flexible sigmoidoscopy, we call it a flex sig. Uh, there's a double contrast enema and CT colonography, which is fairly expensive. Um, you can also have the patients collect uh, stool samples at home and bring them in for analysis, although this isn't done fairly uh, often for colorectal cancer screening. And stool DNA uh, is obviously a little more costly. We will uh, go over some of the age-based assessments and recommendations in the next few slides. Between the ages of 13 and 18, a visit should consist of a history and cursory physical exam. Uh, as I said earlier, pelvic and breast exams uh, need only be done if they're clinically indicated. Our governing body uh, recommends uh, gonorrhea and chlamydia screening in sexually active teens since the vast majority of these infections are without symptoms. As mentioned previously, you know, we usually uh, 
talk about menstrual cycles, contraception, STD, safe sex practices, self-press exams, et cetera. Uh, we also uh, give them information on the HPV exam, or I'm sorry, the HPV vaccine, and uh, make sure that all of their other age-based immunizations are up to date. Between the ages of 19 and 39, a visit should also consist of a history and physical exam. Again, uh, well woman visits beginning at age 21. Our governing body recommends, like I said, gonorrhea and chlamydia testing uh, in sexually active women under the age of 25, uh, since the vast majority of these infections are without symptoms, and it's recommended that HIV status should be checked annually, and it's uh, state by state. Uh, with regard to the interval of HIV screening. Uh, again, check on vaccines, HPV vaccine, uh, influenza vaccine, the Tdap vaccine. As mentioned previously, we, we again, you know, talk about menstrual cycles, contraception, STDs, et cetera. Between the ages of 40 and 64, uh, annual well woman visits are recommended. Uh, pap smears uh, when appropriate, uh, annual mammograms beginning at age 40 with no uh, significant family history, and then colorectal cancer screening um, at age 50 with no family history. It is recommended that the herpes zoster vaccine be given once uh, at the age of 60 to help protect against shingles. And again, as mentioned previously, we review immunizations and talk about uh, menstrual cycles and contraception, et cetera, or any other issues they may be having. These are uh, the recommendations on blood work screening. Um, obviously, each uh, specialty, you know, family practice, uh, internal medicine, et cetera, have their own guidelines regarding uh, blood work screening. But as far as the American College of ob is concerned, we do diabetes testing every three years beginning at 45. Um, if someone was born between 1945 and 1965 and they are unaware of their hepatitis C status, um, it is recommended to check for this. Uh, we continue the HIV uh, screening per state guidelines. Once someone hits 45, a, a lipid profile or cholesterol and triglyceride screening is done every five years and then thyroid stimulating hormone to test for hypo or hyperthyroidism uh, should be done every five years beginning at age 50. Ages uh, 65 and older should continue their annual well woman exams. Um, uh, as we mentioned earlier, if, if they have a history of normal pap smears, then pap smear screening no longer need be done. Um, appropriate uh, colon cancer screening, uh, as mentioned previously, bone density testing to screen for osteoporosis. Uh, if there's no risk factors for osteoporosis, they recommend having this done at age 65 with uh, testing being repeated no more frequently than every two years. Uh, if someone is not on hormone replacement therapy, we try to ensure that they're taking calcium with vitamin D and doing weight-bearing exercises. The decision whether or not to put someone on hormones after menopause could fill up an entire lecture in and of itself, so we won't really get into that at this time. And a one-time pneumonia vaccine is recommended in this age group as well. I hope this uh, helps shed some light on what all is done at the annual well woman visit. Uh, Remember, it's a well woman visit and not the well woman exam because it truly is more than just an exam. And thank you for your time and attention. Um, if anyone has any questions, I will try to answer them. So we have a question. Uh, patient is asking that, saying she had a partial hysterectomy in 2000. How often do I need to get a pap smear? Well, technically, we don't use the terms partial and things like that in, in our specialty. A, a total hysterectomy is removal of the uterus and cervix. 
if you take the ovaries as well, then we say with re, you know removal of ovaries. Um, there are a couple of instances where the cervix may be left during a hysterectomy, and that's called a supracervical hysterectomy. But if the uterus and the cervix were removed during the hysterectomy, and it was not done for uh, cancer, meaning you know it was done for abnormal bleedings or fibroids or something like that, then the patient does not need any further pap smears. Um, they should, however, continue their well woman visits and uh, have pelvic and breast exams performed. There's a question here about uh, situations where uh, HPV goes away on its own. Uh, HPV or human papilloma virus is a virus, so once you are exposed to it, it is always in your body. Now, uh, just like chicken pox or uh, herpes, um, these are also viruses, and once you're exposed to them, they're in your body. Uh, they may lay dormant for quite a while and then choose to express themselves at certain times, but it uh, it's always going to be there. It just uh, but you certainly can have instances where it will show up as positive, and then show up as negative if it's gone dormant. I have a question here about uh, a patient who's prone to having enlarged lymph nodes, lymph nodes uh, near near the breast, um, and asking if those will be picked up on a mammogram. Uh, they certainly can be picked up on a mammogram um, and just enlarged lymph nodes uh, in and of themselves does not indicate you know breast cancer. Uh, they, there certainly could be some other uh, things going on in terms of infections or things like that. You know my my thing with that is that if you if you do have enlarged lymph nodes, and uh, specifically if they're symptomatic, meaning they're tender and things of that nature, I would certainly, you know, have an exam and, uh, and get them checked out. Um, there's a question here about uh, someone that's had an ablation to stop her monthly cycles, uh, but it didn't take. Um, the, I mean, obviously when someone has an endometrial ablation to uh, stop their periods. I mean, this is not a 100% thing. Uh, probably about 70% of women will never have a period again after that. But having a failed ablation is certainly an indication for a hysterectomy, um, although you certainly could have a repeat ablation as well, and that's something that you and your gynecologist would have to decide on. There's a question here about uh, someone who's had a hysterectomy and they are having severe what we call vasomotor symptoms, which are the hot flashes, night sweats, and things of that nature. Um, obviously, the, the only FDA-approved treatment for hot flashes and night sweats uh, is hormone replacement therapy. Uh, there are a couple of other things that can be used in lieu of that. Uh, probably the second line agent is to use what's called an SSRI or a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. Uh, we use these medications to treat uh, depression and anxiety, but there's been several studies that have shown that they work very well with uh, controlling hot flashes and such uh, in patients that either don't want to take hormones or can't take hormones. Um, another medication that can be used is clonidine, which is a uh, blood pressure medication. However, you have to be careful with this uh, in someone that already has uh, normal or low blood pressure to begin with. And then there's certainly lots of alternative uh, medication and herbal type things that are available at uh, stores like GNC and things like that. Uh, the problem with these is that none of them are regulated by the FDA, so it's hard to know that someone's getting a, a steady dose with each uh, each time they take it. Um, I, I can tell you, however, that I have many, many patients that uh, go the natural route and, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of information on the internet with regard to that. Um, there's a question here about uh, someone that had 
something show up on her uh, mammogram and ultrasound and she's going in for a biopsy, uh, what do I think it might be? Well, it's hard to know. Um, you know, when we when a mass is uh, uh, found, I mean, it can either be cystic, meaning fluid-filled, or it can be solid. Um, obviously, a, a solid uh, lesion is probably a little more concerning. But uh, the vast majority of these things that we find are actually benign. They're either, you know, a simple breast cyst or some kind of fibrous tissue or fibroadenoma or something of that nature. Um, you know, it's, I would say your chances of it being benign are certainly higher than it being uh, malignant. But nevertheless, it's definitely something that should be checked out. Uh, there's a question here about... Uh, what age to start mammograms. Um, as I stated in one of the slides, uh, if, if you do not have a primary relative, which is a mother or sister with breast cancer, we start annual mammograms at age uh, 40. However, if there is a mother or sister who has had breast cancer, then we usually start screening at 35. Or, for instance, if, if a mother had uh, breast cancer at age 32, we would probably start at that age, at the age of 32. So we certainly do start earlier um, if there's a strong family history of breast cancer. Uh, there's a question about 3D mammograms. Um, uh, these are fairly new. I don't, I don't really have a lot of information on those in terms of pros and cons. Um, but I think anything that's 3D where you can get, you know, different images and views has is, is definitely got to be an improvement uh, of the system that's already in place. Thank you. I'd like to thank everyone for attending this week's or this month's webinar Wednesday. If you go to kelseysebold.com slash webinars, you can get some more information about the details for our next month's webinar. Thank you again for attending, and have a great day.